Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh And a good day to all of you This is the course KOT121 Organic Chemistry 1 the, For this course, we are going to use the textbook Organic Chemistry 3rd edition by Janice Gorzinski smith And for the first lecture, we are going to start with chapter 1 That is Structure and Bonding Alright, before we go into the structure of any organic molecules, we have to see first why do we need to study organic chemistry. In order to study, we need to study organic chemistry because everything in this world that we use are, are uh, or most probably originated, originated from an organic compound. Even the colours of your the clothes that you wear. Those are dyes that come from the organic compounds. And uh, we look at the trees, the leaves. Yeah? We can extract out organic compounds from all these uh, um, plants. Okay, so, but in order to learn what actually is organic chemistry, we have to go back to the basics. That is the atom. We have to study the atom in order for us to relate what is a, uh, an organic how a, how an organic compound is formed so first of all we look at the atom the structure of an atom before you have already studied uh, the periodic table back when you did in uh, when you studied in form 5 form 6 you studied the periodic table and you know that we have atoms like hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen and we need to study the structure of this atom. And as we can see, the structure of an atom is actually composed of the nucleus in the middle containing of the protons and the neutrons and with the electron clouds uh, around it. So this atom contains in the the nucleus contains positively charged protons and of course the neutrons are not charged they are uncharged and the electron cloud uh, around the nucleus is negatively charged when we study organic chemistry we know that all these organic compounds must contain the carbon atom the carbon atom has uh, can be carbon 12 or it can also be the isotope carbon 13 Carbon-12 consists of 6 protons and 6 neutrons. The atomic number of carbon-12 and carbon-13 is the same. But in carbon-13, they have 7 neutrons as compared to 6 neutrons in carbon-12. So now the mass number of the carbon-12 and carbon-13 are different. One is 12 and the other one is 13. So as we can see, in the periodic table, the elements in the row, in the same row, will be of similar size because they will be uh, located in the same shell. Elements in the same column will have similar electronic and chemical properties as in, for example, uh, halogens. You can see that uh, the halogens will have seven electrons in the outermost shell. All the atoms like fluorine, chlorine, uh, bromine, iodine all have seven electrons in the column. In the same, they are all located in the same column, and they will have similar properties. As a revision, we look back at the periodic table. As we can see, group one A, in the first row, hydrogen is on its own actually. So the first atom in group 1a is actually lithium lithium is already in the second row the first row consists of only hydrogen and uh, the second row would consist of lithium and uh, beryllium and as we go on more to the right we will find there is boron carbon nitrogen oxygen and fluorine Okay, and then uh, the next pre uh, row would consist of sodium, magnesium. Okay, and then and we can see the columns. Group 3A 
4A, 5A, 6A, 7A and 7A is actually all the halides and uh, 6A is cons consists of group 6 actually uh, where you have oxygen, sulfur and all the elements in that group and group 5 is nitrogen, fluor, uh, phosphorus and so on and the carbon is actually located in group 4 looking again at the periodic table we can see some uh, elements would have the outermost shell as the as with the s orbital as in group 1a in group 1a the first element which is uh, that is hydrogen the electron is found to be in uh, the first uh, shell that is the 1s for the second element that is lithium lithium we have the outermost shell as 2s and the third uh, element in uh, is sodium sodium is actually the outermost shell is 3s and an s orbital actually has a sphere of electron density and it is lower in energy than the other orbitals of the same shell that is the p orbital and also the d orbital a p orbital as we can see in the uh, diagram given it is a dumbbell shape and it contains a node of electron density at the nucleus it is of higher energy than the s orbital with the re with reference to the first row we can see that there is only one orbital in the first shell so since each shell can only hold two electrons there are only two elements in the first row which is the hydrogen atom and helium and hydrogen atom would have a configuration of 1s1 and helium has a configuration of 1s2 each element in the second row of the periodic table has four orbitals available to accept additional electrons which is uh, one orbital 2s and three 2p orbitals as we can see in the diagram given the 2s is just the same shape as the 1s only it is slightly bigger in size than the 1s orbital it is spherical and the p the 2p orbitals are all dumbbell shape as we can see we have a 2px 2py and a, a 2pz that is all the three 2p orbitals are uh, belonging to the different axis that it is located on it would now we look at the second row of elements in the periodic table since each of the four uh, orbitals available in the second shell can hold only two electrons there is a maximum capacity of eight electrons for each element in the second row so as we can see the second row the first atom is lithium lithium has one electron in the 2s orbital whereas beryllium would have two electrons in the 2s orbital and we go on to boron which has two uh, two electrons in the 2s and one electron in the 2p carbon would have 2s two electrons and the uh, 2p two electrons nitrogen 2s has two electrons but the p orbitals has three electrons oxygen has four electrons in the p orbital whereas fluorine has five electrons and neon being a, a, an inert gas has six electrons in the p orbital for all organic uh, molecules we need to know uh, we need to study the bonding that exists in a molecule there are many types of bonding so now we are going to review the types of bond bonding that exist for organic molecules actually a bond is a joining of two atoms in a stable arrangement so through this bonding atoms will attain complete outer shell of valence electrons and through bonding also atoms will attain a stable noble gas configuration ionic bonds results from the transfer of electrons from one element to another so we will have the one that is electropositive will have a positive charge 
the one that is electronegative will have a negative charge as in sodium chloride the sodium would have a an e positive and chlorine would have cl negative covalent bonds comes from the sharing of electrons between two nucleus how does an ionic bond occur an ionic bond generally occurs when elements on the far left of the periodic table combine with the elements on the far right ignoring the noble gases a positively charged cation formed from an element on the left side attracts a negatively charged anion form from the element on the right side this the uh, very common example is sodium chloride sodium chloride is actually the salt that we use when we cook so as you can see in the diagram given it, we see an ionic crystalline lattice of sodium chloride where the cations and the ions are arranged in a crystal lattice okay. in covalent bonding um, the most basic of covalent bonds is found in the hydrogen molecule so two hydrogen atoms will uh, form will join together to form a covalent bonds and we can see when each hydro since each hydrogen has one valence electron when they share it will be a pair of electrons that's forming a covalent bond the second row elements in the periodic table can have not more than eight electrons around them for neutral molecules from neutral molecules we have two consequences in the first uh, consequence when we have two one two or three valence electrons which can form one two or three bonds respectively in neutral molecules and atoms with four or more valence electrons will form enough bonds to give an octet this results with the following equation which is the predicted number of bonds will be equals to eight minus the number of valence shells so in the second row elements form fewer than four bonds uh, the octet consists of both bonding which is shared and non-bonding which is unshared electrons unshared electrons are also known as lone pairs okay, the following table shows a summary of the usual number of bonds that is found in the common neutral atoms for example hydrogen has only one bond Okay, the number of non-bonded electron pairs is zero. There is no not uh, all the bond, all the electrons will form bonds. In carbons, carbons will form four bonds, whereas in nitrogen, nitrogen usually forms three bonds with one pair of uh, uh, lone pairs. One pair, and in oxygen, oxygen will form two bonds, and it will have two pairs of lone pairs in um, the halides halides like fluorine chlorine and iodide they will only form one bond and they will have three lone pairs okay in order for us to uh, predict the structure of each uh, molecule we, st we have to review first the lewis structures lewis structures are electron dot rep electron dot representations for molecules there are three general rules for drawing Lewis structures the first one which is we draw only the valence electrons and then give every second row element an octet of electrons if possible and give each hydrogen only two electrons as in the example given hydrogen has one electron the fluorine has seven electrons and when they are when they when then they form a bond the hydrogen will pair off with the non-bonding pair of the fluorine atom and there we will have two electrons around the hydrogen and and we can see there are actually eight electrons now around the fluorine atom so when the hydrogen forms a bond with the fluorine we just 
represent it with a line which is a line will consist of a two electron bond and the lone pairs are just given as pairs of electron dots okay, when we have drawn a Lewis structure we need to determine the formal charge the formal charge is actually the charge assigned to individual atoms in a Lewis structure by calculating formal charge we determine how the number of electrons around a particular atom compares to its number of valence electrons formal charge is calculated as uh, follows eh? which is the number of valence electrons minus the number of electrons an atom owns so the number of uh, so an atom owns all of its unshared electrons and half of its shared electrons okay let us look at the examples given where we can see the number of electrons owned by different atoms in the first example carbon shares eight electrons so carbon owns four electrons but in the second example yes we can see carbon with a double bond each carbon shares still shares eight electrons so each carbon owns for electrons so between these two carbon atoms we can see there are actually eight electrons and if we were to divide them uh, by two we will have each carbon atom with four electrons and example three shows a carbon with three bonds with and a pair of lone pair so this carbon shares six electrons and the carbon has two unshared electrons so carbon owns five electrons so the formal charge for this carbon would be one negative charge since it has one electron more than the uh, its neutral at, than the neutral atom okay looking at carbon we can see the carbon with a negative charge actually has five electrons it has three bonds which is uh, it has three electrons from there and a pair of lone pair that makes it five electrons so the formal charge for this carbon is a negative charge looking at nitrogen we can see the valence shell electrons would be just five but when we have a nitrogen with four bonds it has only four electrons so it would have a positive charge a nitrogen with three bonds and a lone pair ha actually has five electrons which is the same number of number uh, valence electrons so it, the formal charge for this is zero but a nitrogen with just two bonds will have two lone pairs so the number of electrons now is actually six so six is it, uh, being, uh, having six electrons you will now have one extra electron as compared to the valence electrons and for oxygen we see oxygen has six electrons when it has three bonds it would have only five electrons which is one electron less than the valence electrons when it has two bonds it will have two lone pairs so the total number of electrons is six which is the same number as the valence electrons and that will give it a charge of zero but an oxygen atom with just one bond will have three lone pairs that makes it has seven electrons so one electron more than the number of valence electrons so it will have a negative charge okay, what actually are isomers isomers are actually molecules that have the same molecular formula so when we are drawing isomers for example we can see the Lewis structure for this uh, isomers with C2 H6 and oxygen just one Okay, we can draw this isomers in two different forms in the first form we can see we have 
a CH3, CH2 and, and an OH. This is an alcohol, which we call ethanol. And in the second structure, we have a CH3O with a CH3. This is an ether, which we call dimethyl ethers. So when we draw Lewis structure for a molecule with several atoms with uh, more than one arrangement, we just play around with the bonds. In the carbon, we know carbon has four bonds and oxygen will have two bonds. So, and hydrogen will only have one bond. So when we play around with, uh, for example, this uh, molecular formula of C2H6NO, we can have two different structures. These two different structures are actually isomers of different molecules which have same molecular formula and uh, this pair of molecules we, they are called constitutional isomers. Not all elements in the periodic table will follow the octet rule. There are some uh, exceptions to the octet rule. As we can see, elements in groups 2A and 3A. For example, we have BEH2. A barium in group A can only form two bonds. And we can see there are actually only four electrons around this beryllium atom. And in BF3, a boron with a boron in the middle, at the, which is attached to three fluorine atoms, it has only six bonds. And elements in the third row, we can see a sulfur, sulfur dimethyl sulfoxide, which is DMSO. Sulf, the sulfur atom in the middle actually has uh, two bonds with oxygen and a bond each with carbon and a lone pair that makes a total of 10 electrons around the sulfur atom but in sulfuric acid as we can see it has two double bonds with two oxygen atoms and two single bonds with the other uh, oxygen atoms there are actually 12 electrons around the sulfur atom Okay, in the previous slides, we saw how mo molecular structures are uh, can be represented by using Lewis structures. But not all molecular structures can be uh, demonstrated or uh, represented by just one single Lewis structure. For example, certain molecules, like the one in the slide, cannot be represented by just one Lewis structure. We need to use two Lewis structures to represent the anion. The anion. Mm -hmm. So, as we can see, in the diagram given, one structure has a negatively charged nitrogen atom and a carbon-oxygen double bond, and the other negatively charged oxygen atom, uh, the other has a negatively charged oxygen atom and a carbon-nitrogen double bond. And these two structures are called resonance structures or resonance forms and they we always separate these two structures using double headed arrows as shown in the uh, diagram so what are actually resonance structures resonance structures actually are uh, two lewis structures or more having the same placement of atoms but showing different arrangements of electrons. Okay, in order to uh, explain what happens, we use resonance th theory. Okay, we got, when we are looking at two resonance forms, example as given in the anion shown below, it should be noted that neither resonance structure is an accurate representation for the anion HCO and H negative. This structure the true structure is a composite of both resonance forms and is called a resonance hybrid the hybrid shows characteristics of both the structures 
and resonance allows certain electron pairs to be delocalized over two or more atoms and this delocalization adds to the stability of the anion or the ion concerned. A molecule with two or more resonance forms is said to be resonance stabilized. In the slide shown, we can see how to draw resonance structures. Each individual resonance structure A is one resonance structure and B is the other resonance structures. So, when we draw these individual resonance structures, we can draw the resonance hybrid as is as in given in the uh, in the slide on the right. Okay, both these individual resonance structures A and B can be represented by the resonance hybrid as is as in as is given in the resonance structure as you can see to the right. Okay. Now we we see resonance structures are not real. Individual resonance structures does not accurately represent the structure of a molecule or an ion. Only the hybrid does. Resonance structures are not in equilibrium with each other. There is no movement of electrons from one form to the other. Resonance structures are not isomers. Two isomers have the same molecular formula but differ in the arrangements of both atoms and electrons. Whereas, resonance structures have the same molecular formula and the same arrangement of atoms, but they only differ in the arrangement of the electrons. Okay, how do we draw resonance structures? Two resonance, the first rule is that two resonance structures differ in the position of multiple bonds and non-bonded electrons. The placements of atoms and single bonds always stay the same. We can, as we can see in structure A, the position of the lone pair is different from the position of the lone pair in B. And the position of the double bond is also different from the position of the double bond in B. In A, the double bond is between carbon and oxygen. But in B, the double bond is between carbon and nitrogen. In A, the position of the lone pair is on the nitrogen atom. But in B, the position of the uh, lone pair is on the oxygen atom. So two resonance structures must have the same number of unpaired electrons. For instance, as we see C, two unpaired electrons each on a carbon atom and on the oxygen atom. So A and B have no unpaired electrons, but C is not a resonance structure of A and B. The third rule in drawing resonance structures, the resonance structures must be valid Lewis structures. Hydrogen must have two electrons and no second row elements can have more than eight electrons. We look at, for instance, as in the compound given, the carbon atom has 10 electrons here around the carbon. But then, as, in, as you know, carbon can only have 8 electrons, so this is not a valid Lewis structure. Curved arrow notation is a convention that is used to show how electron position differs between two resonance forms. Curved arrow notation shows the movement of an electron pair. The tail of the arrow always begins at the electron pair. As we can see in example 1, the tail of the arrow begins at the double bond. It either begins at the double bond or at the lone pair. The head points to, the, to where the electron pair moves. For instance, we can see the double bond moves to from the carbon on the left that is bonded to the middle carbon. It will move to the carbon on the right. So a bond will form between the carbon on the right and the middle carbon. And the one on the left now has a positive charge. So 
the assignment of the formal charge would be a positive charge because electrons have the this carbon atom now lacks an electron. For in example two, we can move two electrons, two electron pairs, as in uh, the example given. You can see an electron pair moves from the carbon to the carbon attached to it and the electron pair between the carbon and, and the oxygen will move to the oxygen atom and we can see now that the negative charge has actually moved from the carbon atom to the oxygen atom and then so now the oxygen atom is the one that has the negative charge okay, in the examples given above we can see the lone pairs are located on the atom directly bonded to the double bond. In the first example, the carbon with a negative charge, the electron will move to the middle carbon and the, uh, in order to uh, maintain octet, the carbon between the bond between the carbon, uh, middle carbon and the left carbon will move, the electron will be moved to the uh, left carbon and we will get the corresponding resonance structure. In the second example, as we can see, the electron pair is on the carbon atom. So when the electron moves to the, to the following carbon, that is the middle carbon, in order to maintain octet again, the bond between carbon and oxygen must break and the electron will move to the oxygen atom. So the charge now moves to the oxygen atom and the oxygen atom is negatively charged. Okay, now how do we calculate the formal charge? The formal charge is equal to the number of valence electrons which is the number of unpaired, uh, unshared electrons plus the number of shared electrons uh, divided by 2. In the first example we can see for the nitrogen atom the number of valence e electrons is 5. There are no lone pairs. So that is 0. And minus 4 because there are 4 bonds. 4 bonds will be equivalent to um, 8 electrons divided by 2 and we will get 4. So 5 minus 0 minus 4 will give a positive charge for the nitrogen atom. In the second example, as we can see, for, we are still looking at the nitrogen atom, the number of valence electrons is 5. And in this example, there is a pair of lone pairs, that is minus 2. And there are 3 bonds for the nitrogen atom. There are 3 bonds, meaning that 6 electrons divided by 2, that will be 3. So 5 minus 2 minus 3 will give a 0 formal charge. Okay, in the examples given, and at, we can see now an atom bearing a positive charge is bonded either to a double bond or an atom with a lone pair. A double bond, as in the first example, we can see a positive charge is bonded to the carbon. Next to it, the carbon has a double bond with the left carbon. And in the example given below, below it, it's a positive charge that is the carbon the carbon atom is uh, bonded to an oxygen atom that has a lone pair so this lone pair now can move and form a bond with the carbon atom a resonance hybrid is a composite of all the possible resonance structures in the resonance hybrid the electron pairs are drawn in different locations in individual resonance forms and they are localized. When two resonance structures are different, the hybrid looks like the better resonance structure. The better resonance structure is called the major contributor to the hybrid and all others are the minor contributors. The hybrid is actually a weighted average of the contributing resonance structures. Okay, the following slides show an example of a resonance hybrid. The better resonance hybrid uh, resonance structure, sorry, is one that has more bonds and fewer charges. We look at X. X now 
does not have any charge. It is, it has more bonds and zero charge. So this is called the major contributor. Y has a positive charge on the carbon atom and a negative charge on the oxygen atom. And this is the minor contributor. When we determine the molecular shape or structure of a molecule, we need to know first of all two variables, which is the bond length and the bond angle. When we determine bond length, we look at the elements across the periodic table. In this instance, for example, we look at carbon, nitrogen and oxygen. The bond between oxygen and hydrogen is a much shorter bond than the bond between nitrogen and hydrogen and the bond between nitrogen and hydrogen is a shorter bond than the carbon uh, the bond between carbon and hydrogen okay. bond length increases down a column of the periodic table as the size of the atom increases going down the periodic table for instance in uh, for the halides which is chloride chloride and bromide we find that the bromide being the biggest atom has a longer bond length with hydrogen as compared to hydrogen chloride and hydrogen fluoride the following table shows average bond length of various uh, bonds between hydrogen and various atoms when determining the molecular shape of a molecule we need to also uh, take into consideration the bond angle. So bond angle determines the shape around any atom bonded to two other atoms. For instance, the number of groups surrounding a particular atom determines its geometry. A group is either an atom or a pair of uh, or a lone pair of electrons. The most stable arrangement keeps these groups as far away from each other as possible. This is exemplified by the valence shell electron pair repulsion, that is PSEPR theory. So as we can see in the table, when we have two groups, the geometry is linear, the bond angle is 180 degrees. And when we have three groups, the geometry is trigonal planar and the bond angle is 120 degrees. And when there are four groups, the geometry is tetrahedral and we have a bond angle of 109.5 degrees. Okay, in order to determine the, the geometry of a molecule, we see the most uh, basic of all is, the, is a linear uh, geometry. And uh, in the example below, uh, or in the example given here, which is beryllium hydride, where we have beryllium uh, bonded to two hydrogen atoms. Since the atom beryllium ha has only two electrons, it can only be bonded to two groups of two hydrogen atoms as shown. And the angle between beryllium and hydrogen on the left and beryllium and hydrogen on the right is 180 degrees. Another example is ethane. Ethane is a carbon atom that uh, uh, is a compound consisting of two carbon atoms bonded with a triple bond and each carbon atom bonded to a hydrogen atom. The bond between the hydrogen, the, the bond angle between the hydrogen, carbon and carbon is 180 degrees. And this linear structure can be seen as in the following video. This ball and stick model shows the structure of the ethene molecule. As we can see now, there are two these two carbon atoms that has three bonds, which is a triple bond, and attached to two hydrogen atoms in a linear geometry. The following geometry we are going to look at is the trigonal planar. As we can see in the example given, BF3 of boro 
trifluoride has the boron atom in the middle and three fluorine atoms attached to it. And the angle, the angle between the boron, uh, between the fluorine, boron and fluorine is 120 degrees. And in this case, we see there are three groups attached to the boron atom. All three B BF bonds lie in one plane and we call this the trigonal planar. When we see this is also the same uh, geometry for an ethene. If an ethene consists of two carbon atoms with a double bond between the two carbon atoms and each carbon at atom is attached to two hydrogen atoms. So there are actually three groups around each carbon atom. So since all, as we can see, all the six atoms lie in one plane, we call this, a, this is also a trigonal planar geometry. And the angle between the hydrogen carbon hydrogen bonds or the hydrogen carbon carbon bonds are all 120 degrees. Okay, we can see uh, this in the following, an actual model in the following video. This ball and stick model shows the molecule ethene. This ethene actually is consists of two carbon atoms with a double bond and attached to each carbon atom attached to two hydrogen atoms. When four groups are arranged around an atom, they will be arranged in the tetrahedral arrangement. And the bond angle between the, as we can see in the example given, which is methane, a carbon atom bonded to four hydrogen atoms, the hydrogen carbon hydrogen bond uh, is 109 degrees. This is the preferred geometry because the bond angle is larger. The diagram on the right shows a square planar arrangement. This geometry does not occur because the bond angle is only 90 degrees. This is not the preferred geometry. Three-dimensional structures on a piece of paper, we need to use solid lines to represent the bonds in the plane of the paper. A wedge will show the bonds which is coming out from the plane of the paper, that is in front of the plane. And a dash line is used for the bond which is behind the plane. So, as we can see in the diagrams uh, given there and in also the video, the straight lines are for bonds in the plane. And when the, in the ball and stick model, when the uh, hydrogen atom is pointing towards you, that, that would be the front. And it will be represented by the wedge. And the one that is behind will be represented by the dashed lines. Okay, now we have this methane. Methane is actually a tetrahedron and when we draw the molecule of the methane, this will be the solid lines and this, the one that is close to me will be the wedge and the one that is going away from me will be the dashes. Okay, in order to draw a three-dimensional structure, we can also use this three-dimensional structure to represent the molecule in many different ways and this will generate many different equivalent represent representations so as we can see in the following video all the following are acceptable drawings for example for methane CH4 yes. the methane can be drawn in different ways so in the first one we can see this now it's in the same plane these are the straight lines and this is the wedge and this is the dashes now if i were to look at the molecule in this way this would be the straight lines and this would be the wedge and this would be the dashes 
And if I were to look at the molecule in this way, this would be the wedge, these are the straight lines, and this would be the dashes. And then, if I were to make it in this way, now, these are in the same plane, and this is away from it. This is the dashes, and this is the one, that is the wedge. Okay, note that wedges and dashes are used for groups that are really aligned one behind the other. The position of the wedge and the dash does not matter. As we can see in the diagram given, right, the wedge and the dash are aligned. One is in front and the other is at the back. And as in the ball and stick model, we can see the two hydrogen atoms are really aligned one in front of the other. Okay. A non-bonded pair of electrons is also counted as a group. For example, in ammonia, NH3, one of the four groups attached to the central nitrogen atom is a lone pair. The hydrogen-nitrogen bond angle is 107 which is close to the theoretical tetrahedral bond angle of 109.5. The shape is referred to a trigonal pyramid. As we can see in the Lewis structures, there are four groups, right? Four, uh, three are nitrogen-hydrogen bonds and the other is a lone pair, as we can see in the following video. Okay, this is the molecule of ammonia. Ammonia actually has three bonds with hydrogen atoms and the other group is just a lone pair. It has not, uh, it does not have an atom attached to it. So, as we can see now, it is a tetra, uh, it is a pyramid trigonal. In the following slide, we see the water molecule. In the water molecule, we have two of the four groups attached to the central oxygen atom that are lone pairs. The two hydrogen atoms and two lone pairs around oxygen point to the corners of a tetrahedron. The hydrogen-oxygen-hydrogen -hydrogen bond angle is 105, which is close to the theoretical tetrahedral bond angle of 109.5. Water has a bent shape because of the two groups around oxygen are lone pairs of electrons. And uh, we can see this as in the following video. This model shows the molecule of water. The molecule of water has two uh, bonds with the uh, hydrogen atoms and it also has two lone pairs. The lone pairs actually are just imaginary. Um, so so you, as in, uh, you can see in the diagram, the lone pairs are shown, but in the actual molecule, they, are, they don't really exist. So, but the molecule is actually just a V-shape. And the bond between the hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen is actually 105 degrees. To summarize what we have discussed before, you can see now uh, methane and ammonia and water all have the same uh, arrangement of electrons. In both ammonia and water, the bond angle is smaller than the theoretical tetrahedral bond angle as in methane because of the repulsion of the lone pair of electrons. The bonded atoms are compressed into a smaller space. The bond angle now between for the ammonia, which is the hydrogen-nitrogen bond, has become 107 degrees. Whereas in water, because there are two lone pairs, the bond angle is now 105 degrees. We can predict the geometry uh, based on counting the number of groups around the central atom and the following table shows um, the number of groups of atoms around an, uh, an atom the and the geometry and also the bond angles. Organic molecules can be used, can be uh, represented 
using a few structures. The first one that we will see are condensed structures. Condensed structures are structures where you just write the molecule. As, as for example, given here, we have four carbon atoms, CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3. That is one way. The other way, we can, we can write them as CH3, CH2 in the brackets. There are two CH2, so CH2 in the brackets, two CH3. Or, as in the example given below, we have three methyl groups. The three methyl groups can be uh, condensed using a bracket and with a three after the CH3 and CH. Other examples of condensed structures are given in this following slide. When we see they can either, uh, when we have a branch with a methyl, can either, either be written out as in the one on the left or it is written as in the brackets with the one on the right. And then when we have a double bond, this double bond is always written out as in the example given. And when we have a hydroxide, which is the OH group, the OH is still written as it is. So we, the hetero atoms are always drawn without the lone pairs. And in the last example, we can see we have two, C, two chlorides, which is the, the Cl. They are drawn without the lone pairs. Okay, the following slide shows condensed structures containing a CO double bond. So as we can see in the examples given, the double bonds are written out between carbon and oxygen and not as uh, the ones on the right. Okay, other than condensed structures, organic molecules can also be represented using skeletal structures. In skeletal structures, we assume that there is a carbon atom at the junction of any two lines and at the end of any line. And we assume also there are enough hydrogens around each carbon atom to make it tetravalent. And we draw in all heteroatoms and hydrogens directly bonded to them. For example, we see hexane. Hexane has six carbon atoms. And the skeletal structure is the one that is drawn below the line where we see a zigzag line then from this zigzag line at every corner we have one two three there are four corners showing four carbon atoms and at the end of each line which is on the left and on the right is also a carbon atom that makes it six carbon atoms and we assume that every carbon atom will have will have enough hydrogen atoms to make it tetravalent and on, on the right we see a cyclohexane a cyclohexane is actually a ring with six carbon atoms as in the structure we can see uh, on the right so the skeletal structure for cyclohexane is the one that you see on the left that is a circle of with six uh, corners showing six carbon atoms and each carbon will have two hydrogens bonded to it to make it tetravalent. Okay, the following slide shows various examples of organic molecules in skeletal structures. Okay, as a caution, when we are interpreting the skeletal structures, we have to remember that a charge on a carbon atom takes the place of one hydrogen atom. The charge determines the number of lone pairs. A negatively charged carbon atom shows one lone pair. And a positively charged carbon atom shows that there are no lone pairs. Okay, as in the example given for the cyclohexyl ring, a positive charge takes the place of one hydrogen atom. So, as we can see, only one more hydrogen atom is bonded to this carbon. So, this carbon atom 
as no lone pairs. But in the cyclohexyl at the below, we see a negative charge. The negative charge takes the place of one hydrogen atom. So there is only one hydrogen atom bonded there. And since it is a negative charge, this carbon has atom has one lone pair. Okay. We are now going to see how bonds are formed in each of the geometrical structures in the organic molecules. All carbon atoms can only form four bonds. So there are each carbon atom can only form three types of bonds, which are either carbon-carbon single bonds, carbon-carbon double bonds, or carbon-carbon triple bonds. We are now going to discuss how these bonds can be formed. Okay, in order to know how bonds are formed, we have to look at the orbitals and how they overlap to form bonds. The most uh, basic of all bonds is the hydrogen is the bond between two hydrogen atoms. If we, were to, if we were to look at the hydrogen atom, we know that is a, each atom has a 1s orbital. So this, when there are two hydrogen atoms, the 1s orbital of each atom can overlap over each other to form a sigma bond. And the sigma bond is a bond where the electron density concentrates between the two nuclei. As we can see in the diagram given, we have uh, the first uh, hydrogen atom on the left with the one electron in the 1s orbital with the hydrogen atom on the right with the also one electron in the 1s orbital. When these two orbitals overlap, they will form a cylindrical, cylindrical uh, orbital and this is called a sigma bond and the bond as we can see is distributed symmetrically connecting the two nucleus when the two orbitals from the different hydrogen atoms overlap the bond form is cylindrically symmetrical and this bond is distributed equally and they connect the two nuclei forming a sigma bond. When we look at organic molecules, they are more complex molecules. For example, the most basic of all organic molecules is methane. Taking a look at methane, we look at the carbon atom. The carbon atom has two core electrons which is in the 1s orbital plus four valence electrons. To fill atomic orbitals in the most stable arrangement, electrons are placed in the orbitals of lowest energy first. For carbon, this places two in the 2s orbital and one each in 2p orbitals. The lowest ar energy arrangement of electrons for an atom, in this case, for we call it the ground state. If you look at the ground state of the carbon atom, it would only form two bonds because it has only two unpaired valence electrons and CH2 would, should be a stable molecule. However, CH2 is a very unstable species that cannot be isolated under typical laboratory conditions. Note that in CH2, carbon would not have an octet of electrons and we see only two bonds can be formed from two unpaired electrons. A second possibility for the bonds formed in methane, we can say that what happens is a promotion of an electron from a 2s orbital to a vacant 2p orbital would form four unpaired electrons for bonding. This process requires energy because it moves an electron from a lower energy level to a higher energy level. This energy electron configuration is called an electronically 
excited state. And from the diagram given, we can see there is a promotion of an electron from the 2s orbital to the 2p orbital. But this description is still not adequate. Carbon would form two different types of bonds, that is, three with 2p orbitals and only one with a 2s orbital. However, experimental evidence points to carbon forming four identical bonds in methane. So in order to solve this problem, chemists have proposed that atoms like carbon do not use pure S and pure P orbitals in forming bonds. Instead, atoms use a new set of orbitals called hybrid orbitals. Hybridization is actually a combination of two or more atomic orbitals to form the same number of hybrid orbitals, each having the same shape and energy. For instance, if we were to look at the carbon atom again, we will have when the electron is promoted to the p orbitals and hybridization occurs, what happens is that we will get four hybridized orbitals and Name, namely each orbital as sp3 so there will be four sp3 orbitals with four unpaired electrons to describe the shape and orientation of sp3 hybrid orbitals we would have to look at the uh, spherical 2s orbital and the three dumbbell shaped 2p orbitals when they are hybridized, we will see that the new orbital that is formed will have one large lobe and one small lobe, as in the diagram. A p orbital would have two lobes of the same size, but an sp3 orbital, an sp3 hybrid orbital, has a small lobe with a big lobe, and the larger lobe forms a stronger bond. The four hybrid orbitals are oriented towards the corners of a tetrahedron and they form four equivalent bonds as in the diagram given. So in each methane molecule, each bond is formed by an overlap of an sp3 hybrid orbital from the carbon with a 1s orbital from the hydrogen atom. These four bonds points point towards the corners of a tetrahedron. And the diagram for this is shown here. Other than the sp3 hybrid orbitals, we can also form other hybrid orbitals like sp2 and also sp hybrid orbitals. For the sp hybrid orbitals to form, we need one 2s orbital and one 2p orbitals. When they are hybridized, we will have two sp hybrid orbitals form. The other two 2p orbitals will remain unhybridized. To form the sp2 hybridized orbitals, we need one 2s orbital and two. 2p orbitals and the hybridized orbitals form would be the sp2 hybridized orbitals and there will be three sp2 hybridized orbitals the other 2p orbital remains unhybridized in order to determine the type of hybridization of an atom in a molecule we have to look at the number of groups around the atom the number of groups, which is with the atoms and non-bonded electron pairs, will correspond to the number of atomic orbitals that must be hybridized to form the hybrid orbitals. We need, when we have two groups around an atom, the number of orbitals used would be 2. And we will have two sp hybrid orbitals. And when the groups around an atom are three, we will use three orbitals. And 
the type of hybrid orbital is an sp2 and we will have three sp2 hybrid orbitals and when there are four groups around an atom the number of orbitals used would be four and we will have four sp3 hybridized orbitals this following slide shows examples of sp sp2 and sp3 molecules for sp molecules we use the beryllium hydride okay. in this case beryllium is sp hybridized and the bond that is formed between beryllium and hydrogen is an overlap of the sp orbital with the 1s orbital and the b the hydrogen beryllium hydrogen bond is 180 degrees for the sp2 orbitals you can see the example given is pf3 boron the middle atom is sp2 hybridized and there is an overlap of this sp2 hybrid uh, orbital from uh, boron with the 2p orbital from fluorine since there are three sp2 orbitals the angle between the f boron f is 120 degrees looking from the side view we can see that there uh, there will be one unhybridized p orbital and there is no electron in this p orbital and going down we see the molecules ammonia and also water for ammonia the nitrogen atom has five electrons and the hybridized orbital is sp3 since only three hydrogen atoms are attached to the nitrogen we will only have three bonds so the other pair of electrons would be the lone pair so in ammonia we have three sp3 orbitals that are where that is shared and one pair of unshared electrons and the shape of the molecule is a pyramid trigonal and for water as we can see water oxygen also has four pairs of electrons we have two unshared electron pairs and two shared electron pairs water has two bonds with hydrogen so now the shape of this molecule is actually just a V shape for organic molecules uh, the other bigger molecule next to methane would be ethane ethane has two carbon atoms so each carbon atom would be tetrahedron in shape and since they are tetrahedron in shape there are actually four bonds there is a bond between the carbon there is a carbon carbon bond and there are bonds between carbon and three hydrogen so there will be two sp3 hybridized orbitals that overlaps to form the carbon carbon bond and each of the carbon hydrogen bond is formed by the overlap of the sp3 hybridized on carbon with the 1s orbital on hydrogen for the molecule ethane we, there is another additional feature that we can show a rotation can occur between the carbon carbon bonds we can see here like this okay the next molecule would be ethylene ethylene has a double bond between the carbon carbon and there are three groups around each carbon that is each carbon is trigonal and planar and each carbon is sp2 hybridized and we can see that the hybridization for the sp2 is from the one uh, the 2s orbital and two of the 2p orbitals and there is a 2p orbital that has one electron and it is not hybridized okay now. each ethylene molecule will have three sigma bonds uh, around each carbon atom 
so there will be actually five sigma bonds all together that is one sigma bond between the carbon carbon atom and sigma bonds between carbon hydrogen atoms and there will also be a pi bond as we can see uh, an overlap between the two p orbitals that were not hybridized and this overlap of the two p orbitals form the second bond in between the carbon carbon bond unlike the carbon carbon bond in ethane rotation about the carbon carbon bond in ethylene is restricted it can only occur if the pi bond breaks first and then reforms a process that needs considerable energy okay as we can see in the diagram there is uh, the there is no rotation between the carbon carbon double bond the next molecule is acetylene acetylene is a is a an organic molecule with a carbon carbon triple bond and in order to form a this triple bond we look at the how hybridization occurs so we need an sp bond to in order to have a linear structure as in acetylene for this to occur there will be a hybridized sp 2s with a p with a 2p orbital and the hybridized orbital that is formed is the sp orbital and there will also be 2p 2 2p orbitals that are not hybridized and they will each have an electron then let us, let us compare now between ethylene and acetylene when we look at figure 1.13 from before the ethylene is from from the overlap of two sp2 hybrid orbitals forming the carbon carbon sigma bond and there is overlap of two 2p orbitals to form the carbon carbon pi bond but in the acetylene each carbon atom has two sp hybrid orbitals the carbon hydrogen bonds and the carbon carbon bonds are sigma bonds okay, other than sigma bonds in the acetylene molecule we also have pi bonds so to describe pi bonds we can see each carbon atom has two unhybridized 2p orbitals that are perpendicular to each other and to the sp hybrid orbitals the side by side overlap of two 2p orbitals on one carbon with two 2p orbitals on the other carbon creates the second and third bonds of the triple bond all triple bonds are composed of one sigma bond and two pi bonds to summarize the bonding of an acetylene molecule we can see the overlap of two sp hybrid orbitals from the carbon carbon bond forms the sigma bond and overlap of two sets of 2p orbitals from the two carbon carbon forms the pi bonds we can now summarize the covalent bonding seen in carbon atoms in carbon compounds as follows when there are four groups bonded to the carbon atom the hybridization is sp3 the bond angle is 109.5 an example of this is ethane the carbon carbon bond is a sigma bond when we have three groups of atoms attached to the carbon the hybridization of the carbon atom is sp2 the bond angle is 120 an example of this is ethylene where we see one pi bond between the carbon carbon atom and one sigma bond between the carbon carbon atom and when we have only two groups of uh, bonded to carb to the carbon atom the hybridization of the carbon atoms are sp and the bond angle is 180 degrees an example of this is acetylene in acetylene between the two carbon atoms there are there is one sigma bond which is the sp sp hybridized orbitals and two pi bonds 
which is the 2p overlapping with the other 2p from the other carbon atom. There are two sets of 2p overlap orbitals. Bond length and also bond strength can be summarized as follows. As the number of electrons between the two nuclei increases, bonds become shorter and stronger. Therefore, triple bonds are shorter and stronger than double bonds. And double bonds are shorter and stronger than single bonds. The, st the strength and length of the carbon-hydrogen bonds vary depending on the hybridization of the carbon atom. The shortest bond would be the bond between the sp carbon with the hydrogen and the longest bond would be between the sp3 carbon with the hydrogen. But the, the strength of the bond would be otherwise. The sp, the sp carbon with the hydrogen bond is the strongest as compared to the sp3 uh, with the hydrogen. Bond length and bond strength for ethane, ethylene and acetylene is as given in table 1.3. Bond length and also bond strength depends on the S character of the bond. As we can see for the sp hybrid, since there is one 2s orbital and there are two hybrid orbitals, it will have 50% S character. For the sp2, there is 33% S character and the sp3 has 25% S character. When the S character of the bond increases, the strength is also increases. Okay, note that the percentage of S character increase as the percentage of S character increases, a hybrid orbital holds its electrons closer to the nucleus and the bond becomes shorter and stronger. Although sp3, sp2 and sp hybrid orbitals are similar in shape but they are actually different in size. The biggest would be the sp3 and the smallest is the sp orbital. Each covalent bond can, be, can have different polarity. The polarity of the bond depends on the electronegativity of the elements that are sharing the pair of electrons. When we look at the periodic table, we can see that electronegativity increases across the period and it decreases as we go down the column. Actually, what is electronegativity? It is a measure of an atom's attraction for electrons in the bond. Electronegativity values are used as a guideline to indicate whether the electrons in a bond are equally shared or unequally shared between two atoms. When electrons are equally shared, the bond is nonpolar. When differences in electronegativity result in unequal sharing of electrons, the bond is said to be polar and, and is also known to have a separation of charge or a dipole. Looking at carbon-carbon bonds, each carbon would have the same electronegativity value, so the bond is definitely non-polar. Between the carbon and hydrogen, carbon has a 2.5 electronegativ electronegativity value, whereas hydrogen has a 2.2 electronegativity value. This bond is also said to be nonpolar because the small difference in the electronegativity between the carbon and the hydrogen is ignored. Bonding between atoms of different electronegativity values results in unequal sharing of electrons. In the carbon-oxygen bond, the electrons are pulled away from carbon towards oxygen. Carbon has a 2.5 value, but oxygen has a 3.4 value, the element of high, higher electronegativity. The bond is polar or polar covalent bond. The bond is said to have a dipole moment, so there is a separation of charge. A delta positive means 
the indicated atom is electron deficient and a delta negative means the indicated atom is electron rich so we can see for the carbon oxygen bond the oxygen is electron rich and the carbon is electron deficient and the carbon oxygen bond is a polar bond the direction of polarity in a polar bond or in a bond is indicated by an arrow with the head of the arrow pointing towards the more electronegative element. In order to determine the polarity of the molecules, we can follow the following steps. First, we use the electronegativity differences to identify all of the polar bonds and the directions of the bond dipoles. And then we determine the geometry around individual atoms by counting groups and decide if individual dipoles cancel or reinforce each other in space. For example, the molecule given here is CH3Cl. The bond between the carbon and the chlorine is actually a polar bond and since chlorine has a higher electron density, the, bond, the polarity would be more the negative charge should be more towards chlorine and the carbon will have a positive charge. A polar molecule has either one polar bond or two or more bond dipoles that reinforce each other. An example is water. In water, we can see the two individual bond dipoles reinforce each other. Oxygen has a higher electronegative activity negativity value than hydrogen. So the net dipole bisects the hydrogen-oxygen hydrogen bond angle. The bent representation shows that the dipoles reinforce each other. And water is a polar molecule. A non-polar molecule has either no polar bonds or two or more bond dipoles that cancel each other. An example is carbon dioxide. The two dipoles between the carbon oxygen are in opposite direction. So they just cancel each other and carbon dioxide is a non-polar molecule. Okay, this ends the first chapter for the discussion for organic chemistry. We will follow with the second step second chapter soon.